Hello, and welcome to Session 3C, Building Strong SUD SMI Services Using Evidence-Based Practices. You are on the Improving Services track. My name is Joe. I will be your producer for this event. And before we get started, I just want to run you through our usual housekeeping slide. So this event is being recorded, and audio is now broadcasting. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And that ends our housekeeping slides. I would now like to ask our moderator to unmute and take the floor. Pat Tucker? Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon to some people. Um, welcome. Glad to have you back with us today. We have some amazing speakers today um, focusing on improving services. Uh, today we're going to be focused on building strong SUD, SMI services using scientific and evidence-based practices. I, I know you get to hear that all the time, those evidence-based practices. Well, today we're going to explore them more. Our first speaker is going to be Lori Curtis. Um, she's pretty much done everything. She's been a practitioner, a manager, an educator, a consultant, and she comes to us with 40 years of experience. Uh, she's worked in policy and organizational development, community service management, and service delivery, facilitation. She's, she's pretty much done everything. So she's bringing a wealth of experience to the table, and we're happy to have her. Our, other speaker is Joe. Uh, Joe Hyde is, comes to us also with more than 30 years of management experience in mental health and substance use prevention, early intervention and treatment. Uh, in his current role, he's the technical expert lead at JBS International. And again, a wealth of knowledge. He's, he's pretty much done it all. He, you're going to learn a lot from him. And our final speaker, but, you know, I think she stands on her own, is Gabriela Zapata Almas. She comes to us with 15 years of experience with working with people living with HIV AIDS impacted by housing instability, SUDs, and mental health conditions, as well as survivors of domestic violence and other trauma. And she's provided direct services, training, advocacy, and consulting, and leading programs using a trauma-informed approach, motivational interviewing. Well, all of those sound like evidence-based practices. So I'm going to stop talking and let our speakers do the talking because I think they have a lot to teach us. I'm going to start. We're going to start with Lori. Lori, kick us off. Hi, everyone, and good afternoon we, or good morning, uh, depending upon where you are. Thank you, Pat, for those wonderful introductions. However, I feel very, very, very old when you talk about 40 years of experience, so I think we need to mitigate that. But given that I'm the antique on the team today, I'm going to start us with some history. And I'm going to take a look a little bit, a real quick romp through what are evidence-based practices and why are they important to us and to our field. There have been treatments around for mental health issues for thousands and thousands of years. Each one of these treatments have been based on our beliefs about what caused um, mental health issues at that time. And our beliefs have changed over the years from exorcism to rebalancing of bodily humors and weak blood. And you see here um, a number of old ads um, that I've pulled. And each one of these was billed as an effective treatment for a mental health issue. How many of us remember or knew that 7-Up was actually had started with lithium? That's where the up came in 7-Up. Um, and we may giggle at some of these old adverts, but how do you know they work? How do you know they didn't work? We have to recall that for each one of these approaches, they worked for somebody some of the time. 
but they didn't work for everybody all of the time. We also know that placebos themselves, the idea that this might work for me, also works about 25% of the time, according to, to the research. We all want what works. People who we serve want to feel better. They deserve access to the most effective practices that we can provide in our current environment. Funders want to use their resources wisely. They want to pay for works, what works. They don't want to pay for what doesn't work. Practitioners and providers want to help people strengthen their resilience and, and recovery to improve health and wellness. One way of knowing what works is through science and through the scientific method, where we try to objectively and fairly determine not just what is working and what doesn't work, but when it works and when it doesn't, for whom it works, and for whom it doesn't. So there's a lot of nuance to trying to sort out that question, what works. Evidence-based practice is the use of current best research to evidence to inform decisions about our treatment um, and service approaches. They also inform our policies. EBP, as we, is the shorthand for evidence-based practice, is traditionally defined in terms of a three-legged stool, um, starting, uh, integrating three basic principles. One is the research, what does the science say? But that's not the only part, only thing that makes an evidence-based practice. Those of us who have been around in the field and using these practices, we develop our own sense of, uh, our own knowledge about what works and what doesn't work and when it works and for whom it works. So we are scientists in the field in our own right. And we work to rapidly identify each person's unique needs and what might be useful for that individual. Client preferences also make a difference. And what I know as a client, as a patient of, of healthcare services, I know what my body is. I know how my mind works. I know what works better for me than, or has over time than other things. I am a part of this dialogue. And the people you serve are part of the dialogue about what works for them. And that's one of the reasons why there's great emphasis on self-determination, choice, shared decision-making, and some of these other approaches, because individuals' perspectives and clinician perspectives are part of the um, determination of an evidence-based practice. What works in one situation may not work, work for another. What works for one person may not work for another. On your slide, you see a whole bunch of different kinds of bridges. Um, the purpose of a bridge is to get you from point A to point B. But each one of these bridges are very different. The net suspension across the gorge will not work in situations where you've got to get a vehicle along a steep mountainside. We can think of EBPs as different types of bridges or models of treatment and service. Each model or each EBP is studied in a very specific context, delivered to in a very specific or defined way, and, observe, ob, and the scientists observe how it works in a very carefully defined group of people. This structured research becomes our data or our evidence that something works or doesn't work. But I want you to hear how contextual that is. Fidelity um, is all to the model. You probably have heard a number of times over, over the course of your work and careers. When we change what we do from the model or the approach that was studied, sometimes that changes how effective that approach can be or is. A Japanese footbridge might be very effective in its garden context, but you apply that to a different situation, like a wide span of water, it's not going to be as effective. Similarly, if you leave out something, like in this particular span, it's also not as likely to be as safe or as effective over time. And it's the same thing with our mental health evidence-based practices. Every EBP has been found effective in one setting for one group of people and delivered in one way to get the same results as the scientists found 
you need to deliver it in the exact same way. This is called fidelity or fidelity to the model. Do it the way it was designed to be done, the way the researchers found it effective. Joe and um, Gabriella will dive in a bit deeper than I will to some of these evidence-based practices, and Gabriella will talk about adaptation um, and the parameters of adaptation of some of these models as we shift them out of the study context into your practice context. What can we do and what may we not want to do? But I'm going to take a look here at some of the models of service that have been found effective. And this is a high level introduction because we don't have a lot of time this afternoon. Here are some of the examples of evidence-based practices that have been found um, effective for people with serious mental illness. There's also adaptations of these for people uh, experiencing substance use disorders, trauma, have trauma experiences, and also homeless, who are experiencing homelessness. These have been found effective treatment models, but not all of them are widely available. Um, for example, in 2016, assertive community treatment, an intensive team-based care model um, that has been long established and perhaps was our first EBP, is provided to only 2% of the people served in state systems nationwide. That's 2%. So while they, we know this approach is effective for some people some of the time, it's not available to most of the people most of the time. Permanent supported housing, you've heard a great deal about during this conference. Um, and it is, a, it is an evidence-based practice. It is a combination of housing and services that are shown by the research to um, be cost-effective way to help people live more stable and productive lives while reducing the overall cost of care. There is a number of different supported housing approaches. Um, and these kinds of services can be found in mixed income, scattered site, as well as more traditional housing um, kinds of settings. Supported housing often works well for those who face the most complex challenges. Individuals and families confronted with homelessness who also have very low incomes or serious persistent issues that may include addiction, alcoholism, HIV AIDS, and other, other diverse kinds of disabilities. In supported housing, um, house, you, housing is first, and everything else follows. Um, supportive housing must be coupled with social services, such as job training, life skills training, um, stability tra um, recovery services, peer-based services, case management. People who use this program or this approach consistently report higher satisfaction in their housing than um, other kinds of housing situations. Supported employment or individual placement and support is another evidence-based practice. And research has shown that 60 to 70 percent of people with serious mental illness do want to work and that supported housing responds effectively to these needs and improves a range of work-related outcomes. Work is recovery. It is part of recovery. Recovery doesn't happen after work, and work doesn't happen after recovery. They work simpatico. Assertive community treatment and intensive case management um, our other evidence-based practice I referenced a, a couple of minutes ago, um, assertive community treatment and intensive case management are both typically geared to helping those um, with serious and complex needs who may be considered not ready or higher risk for community living. Both of these approaches are team-based, community, and outreach focused with small caseloads. And that's one of the evidence um, factors, fidelity factors that's really important is the size of the caseload. You want this, if a project, if a service works for a caseload of 1 to 20, asking a staff person to service 1 to 80, that approach, however effective it may be, is not going to be effective as effective in your practice. The, those components of the fidelity really do impact the outcomes. Both ACT and ICM are geared towards providing ongoing and integrated support. Studies find that they reduce hospitalization and do increase the retention and care. They can impact homelessness, especially when integrated into different specific housing models and programs. 
Critical time intervention is a little less known, um, but it is an evidence-based practice, and its approach focuses on providing intensified services during periods of transition. And it's been found that those periods of transition, for example, if someone's moving from a hospital to the community or from a shelter to housing or different housing um, services, that that's when people get lost. Our service system is fragmented and it's complex and it's very challenging for, for individuals. This is a short-term intervention bridge program to help address that fragmentation and that will help people stay engaged in services. It's been found to reduce both homelessness and hospitalization and the impact of this service impacts after the service is withdrawn. So it's a short-term service, but its impact lasts over, over time. RAISE is another new, newer evidence-based practice, and this has been studied and developed by the Center for Practice Innovation at Columbia University in New York. Um, and they have led some very interesting and powerful research on, um, on the RAISE program. And this is, stands for Recovery After Initial Schizophrenia Episode, and it focuses on first episode psychosis, largely with young adults, which as we learned yesterday and from our plenary speakers is, is an increasing population of individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So this becomes an important EBP to be aware of. Um, this, uh, the coordinate, it's also known as coordinated specialty care. And CSC promotes shared decision making, uses a team of specialists who work with each person to create a very tailored and individual treatment plan. The studies have found that it has shows significant improvements in education and employment and um, a decreased hospitalization rate. Psychoeducation has been around a long time, and we see this in a number of formats, both individual one-to-one -one things we do in conversation um, with individuals, but also in groups. And it's also been integrated into a number of family education or psychoeducation programs for, for families across the board. The idea with this is that by increasing people's knowledge or understanding of, of a disorder and treatment options, that this will help individuals and their family members to cope more effectively, to be able to navigate the system more efficiently, um, and it's often but not exclusively diver, delivered as part of family, family support groups. It has been found to reduce relapse in admission, readmission rates, increase medication follow-through, and increase satisfaction with services. Lastly, um, cognitive behavioral approaches, which include dialectical behavior therapy, um, this provides individuals with new skills to manage painful emotions and decrease emotional conflict in relationships. It focuses on mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotional regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. And I think Joe or Gabriella will spend a little bit more time um, diving into to this. On this slide um, are a number of SAMHSA's EBP, or Evidence-Based Practice Toolkits, that have been developed on a number of these practices and some others that we have not mentioned here this morning. You can check those out. And you may also want to check out SAMHSA's new um, Evidence-Based Practices Resource Center. You can find it at this site. Um, and you will find lots of information on some of these practices and others. And with that, Joe, I am going to let you deep dive. Sounds like fun. Okay, let me make sure that this clicking thing is working. And um, let's see. Okay, there we go. Oh, hot dog, it's working. Well, greetings, everybody, and thank you so much for uh, being on this webinar. Hopefully what I'm going to be talking about here makes sense for you and is, is relevant for you. Um, I, I have worked previously in mental health services, in mental health centers, and in SUD services. Um, and the perspective that I'm bringing to the, our conversation about evidence-based practice um, has changed over time. Um, and that what I really want to focus about 
are the targeted specific evidence-based practices that are transportable. That some of the great models that were just discussed are really team-based um, efforts or in some places they're more site-based efforts. But I know some of the, you folks on the call are working in sort of, if you will, sort of inside the walls of your facility and other folks are out in the community and really want to take a look at those kinds of evidence-based strategies and approaches that you can carry with you anywhere. Um, and I think that there's a fair amount of evidence connected to those, but that was really my, my focus. And it really began for me, oh my goodness, probably back in the 90s, 1990s, uh, when the commissioner, I worked in Massachusetts in the Mental Health Center at that time, launched this initiative called Clinics Without Walls and really began to get us to think about how are we and what are we going to do yeah, some people can come into the clinic and that's great, but other people can't or won't or access is an issue. So what can we trade, carry out to the community? So what I want to talk about then in terms of this is that um, um, we've already had the discussion about evidence, but I think for you as practitioners, I think it's really important to understand what is the theory of change that is sort of the backbone of this evidence-based strategy. I mean, if you look at something like cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing, for, for um, instance, you know, EMI spent a lot of time in its theory of changes as people resolve their ambivalence to change and begin to mobilize their internal motivations for change to a point of activation, that that's sort of the essential part of the, their, their, their theory of change. Um, if you look at cognitive behavioral approaches, uh, where many of the EBPs are really rooted in, to be, um, to be I think, clear, um, you're looking at things like, you know, skills-focused activities sort of build the strengths, build the capacities, build the abilities for self-efficacy and, and decision-making that help persons improve both their functional abilities and their overall quality of life. And then the other part of, of, of sort of a theory of change, I think with all of these, that speaks to, you know, that if we just talk to folks, it may be an enjoyable conversation, but we need to be, have a certain action orientation. And for myself, in the, I mean, I view myself as a cognitive behavioral therapist, but practically speaking, I am far more behavioral these days than I am cognitive, that people sort of need to begin doing things better for themselves and then work on the cognitions later. Um, as was also said, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, one shoe doesn't fit all. And so things like the pace in which services are delivered, the challenges and the the, the time that needs to be spent building rapport, building engagement, building collaboration, particularly with our SMI populations, may take a lot longer than the worried well who might come into a private practice being distressed about work. Um, so that the, the, there are differences there that I think it's really important for us to understand as sort of vital kind of contextual factors. Um, that, from my perspective, I mean, the, in like plain English, um, you know, what evidence-based practices are, they are an important component of the systems of care, and that we are all engaged in systems of care, so that's an important element, and it's part of what contributes to the change. I think EBPs are transformational for organizations that overall strengthens quality of service. And then, as has already been say, said, these are proven strategies to increase the likelihood of positive outcomes. What it's not, <clears throat> it's not a way to trick people into changing their behavior, as, um, as some folks sometimes have sort of wondered about. It's also not a magic bullet um, that, um, that there is evidence that it is better than eclectic or business as usual kind of things, but you know sometimes we you know we have complex people that we're working with, 
And you know what? It's it's something that just happens once you've you know, sat through a webinar or, or a two-day training, and that's not the case. If you're going to um, uh, adopt an evidence-based training, absolutely there is training, but equally so, it's important that you spend time or you find the opportunity within your company or outside of it sometimes getting the kind of coaching and precepting that you need so that you have really embodied these skills and practices and are doing them with that acceptable level of fidelity. To quote a, an old friend of mine, I think the, 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 that coaching and precepting is built upon the premise that nothing new is ever done 100% right the first time. We need that coaching. We need that supervision. We need that precepting to do it well and have it really work well for us and, and the persons that we're serving. Um, so the logic model, you know, um, really in terms of this, when we're looking at sort of evidence-based practices, you know, we've got mental illness and substance use issues that people are experiencing. There are also then these contributing factors and conditions like homelessness, housing, SES, uh, access to care. And then we try and do our best to match the practices where there is the best fit. There are some fabulous practices out there, um, but they may not be particularly transferable. And so I think that it's, it's, um, it's really important for you to understand, will this fit within the scope of work that I'm doing? Um, as I said, you know, consider the characteristics of the populations that you're working with. Not only those sort of more easily identifiable ones, all the determinants, but also look at the readiness of these people. And I think some of the great work that comes out of motivational interviewing looks at readiness in terms of the internal readiness. But the other things we need to look at, are we asking things, are we trying to guide people towards things that is beyond their capacity in the moment, either in terms of accessing it or in terms of their, their ability to successfully engage with it. So I think that it's important to be careful and understand that. And you'll hear us a bit more about you know, necessary modifications and adaptations um, about this, uh, about your EBPs. A little side story, I was at this research conference a number of years ago, and the first scholar got up there and talked about uh, the importance of evidence-based practices. And we started counting myself and my colleague, Nick, and he used the term fidelity to model 30-some times. Um, which like, kind of struck, struck me. The next person got up there who was also a scholar and who started off to get people's attention. He said, pure fidelity to a model is a myth. And we were like, what? And he said is that you know, we have to make it work in a good enough way, in a reasonable and appropriate way, in the, in the system that we work in, with the populations we work, and with the resources that we have that are available. And I think that that, that that was a very wise thing. So I think that a lot of work is that what's going to fit? My focus in our conversations here are primarily going to be um, looking at portable interventions, things that you can do both in the clinic and something you can do in the field as well. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, I'll just do it briefly, is that, you know, it's tough to sustain EBPs in some settings, sometimes because it doesn't fit. I think one of the reasons why lovely programs like PACT aren't as widespread as they probably should be or could be is that they're expensive. And so that resource, there's resource limitations in public services. And then you've got staff skills. Um, you might have some systems constraints. Particularly, I mean, I'm doing some work in Virginia right now around adoption of medication-assisted treatment, and that there are entire regions and counties that don't have a single prescriber. And then, you know, there are other kinds of constraints, and it's you know, it's important to recognize that it's not as easy, and it, it oftentimes takes some deliberate effort on the part of the organization and the practitioners to do something that makes sense for you. Okay. So let's first off talk about motivational interviewing. I, I loved this quote by Blaise Pascal for a long time about people generally are better persuaded 
by the reasons that they come to as opposed to those that are provided to them by others. And uh, I do think with many practitioners, and I'm as guilty of it at times as others, is that, um, that, that we jump to solution too quickly and that, that it makes sense that we need to engage with people, build that collaboration, and really help facilitate their finding their own compelling reasons that are sufficient enough that they're going to change. And I think that that really is the backbone of MI. Um, I, if you haven't read it, I mean, it's a great read. You know, there's Bill Miller's book, uh, or Miller and Rolnick's book. This is the newer version that came out in 2013. Um, there's a ton of resources out there. There's a lot of videos. Most states have some pretty good quality training and coaching that follows it up. I would, if you've not been formally trained and had that experience with them, I would strongly encourage you to do that because you can use it anywhere. Even if you've got kids at home that are 13 years old and their rooms are a mess, you can use it with them too. It, and that's a tough audience. Um, the basic task with MI, you first must focus on engagement. Um, to quote a, a wise psychologist I once worked with, she said, it's hard to do therapy and behavior change talking to an empty chair, that you really have to build the engagement and the collaboration. Then you want to bring, bring focus to the conversation, <clears throat> and it's regarding, you know, the health and the welfare and perhaps the risky or harmful behaviors that are going on with the population and really looking for them to begin to find reasons that work for them why they might want to change. And it may not necessarily be our reasons, um, but if, if it's their reasons, those reasons work. I mean, it's important, again, that we, we make sure that it's not our pony in that race. And then we negotiate plans that make sense or the person you're talking to. And too quickly, people jump to case management and jump to plans before that preliminary work is done. And you oftentimes just don't get the follow-through that you might otherwise do. So I think EMI is an essential piece. Another thing that you might want to consider, and it comes out of the behavior therapy kind of world, is the use of contingency management. I know a worker that I supervised at one point in time and it cost him, I think, about five bucks a week or something like that. And sometimes the agency had the money otherwise. He would grab and bring along with him when he was doing outreach work, like a bag of apples. Or if there was a sale, he might grab a bunch of granola bars or something like that. And that it sort of was in very basic behavioral ways. It was positively and without spoken word reinforcing of the engagement process with that person. There are other kind of contingency management things that are done, you know, as they're site specific. If somebody shows up for an appointment, you know, they might, you know, get a gift card for a free cup of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts or whatever it is. But there are nifty things related to that that can really help with engagement and people following through. So I think it really is something um, uh, that you might want to consider as a, as a possibility. Um, consequences work, you know, we, you know, and that's connected to contingency management. Um, you know, rewards increase desired behaviors. Negative consequences generally decrease them. One of the things that I would say about the persons that we're serving is that their life experience sort of bottoms in terms of consequences are way farther below much of what we might ever be ethically or or personally willing to consider. And they've had horrible things happen in their world. And so rewards tend to be the way I think most and more appropriate consequences tend to lean. Um, skills development. Um, again, this is straight out of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and that I think with persons, particularly in street outreach, social connectedness is an important piece. Um, and oftentimes you are the first place for social connectedness and then maybe at um, a place that's addressing way more concrete needs. If, if persons that we've interviewed talk about their priorities, going to see the doc about medications or seeing a therapist in the agency might be like number seven or eight or nine. 
Um, it may not be at the top of their priority list, although it might be at yours. So it's important to recognize you know, where are the priorities of this person. And for these folks, it might be things like, I've got a toothache and I want to see a dentist. Um, I need to get food. I need a safe place to live. Um, I'm, I haven't gotten my social security check. Uh, I need help. Those are, you know. But so I think it's really important to understand the priorities. So connection is first. The second thing that we oftentimes do, particularly when people aren't quite ready to make the change towards the direction we want, or we, we, we you know, may well be certainly best for them, is to look and have some of those conversations with folks. And you can do it in an in my fashion where you are appropriately sort of voicing your worry or your concern, and then to have conversations about so given that, no, you're not willing to come into a shelter right now, you know, let's talk a bit about, you know, I'm concerned about your safety. What are things that you can do and you'd be willing to do that would lower the risk of, like, bad things happening for you? So those kind of risk-reducing kind of conversations are oftentimes part of skill development. Problem solving um, is, is, um, is an important piece. Um, depending on the level of cognitive disturbance that some of our folks have, that may be a bit more challenging than for other people. And problem solving is certainly there. <clears throat> and then generally when people get become a bit more involved, there are a core set of coping skills, whether it's mindfulness or, or you know, effective communication, um, building networks of social support, all those kinds of things are, are really important. I just did a focus group last week with a woman who um, is diagnosed as having schizophrenia. And she's relatively stable, and she was homeless for a period of time. And she talked about she just got a book deal signed for herself, and she's written and illustrated a children's book. So it was really uplifting for all of us that indeed recovery is possible, even for folks for whom the outcomes oftentimes can look pretty bleak. So then the other thing is about, you know, affect regulation, as, as was previously mentioned. So that those are kind of the skills, and those can be translatable and transferable whether you're in the office or out of the office. So the last thing I want to talk about in terms of evidence-based practices <clears throat> is this whole notion of behavior activation that, um, that um, and it's become really part and parcel of sort of the newer waves of cognitive behavioral therapy and DBT and ACT and all those models <clears throat> because we can talk about things, we can think about things, but we ultimately want to start doing things a little bit differently. And sometimes the difference can be very small. Um, but if the person is making a conscious decision to do something a little bit different, you can build upon that. Um, and that, that oftentimes, you know, at the end of a conversation with somebody is where then you say, well, what's something you can do for yourself next week in terms of whatever? And to have those kind of conversations and get kind of consistent, you know, persistent, or consistent, that's the right word, specific about, sorry about that, um, so that you can negotiate with the person about, yeah, I'm going to do whatever it is. And then you talk a bit about more. I mean, you, you reinforce it, obviously, but you also want to talk about, you know, okay, how's that going to happen and when's that going to happen? Is there a way I can support you? Is there someone else that can support you? Um, and that be, you know, behavior activation is really something that you're seeing significantly adopted in all kinds of the behavioral and treatment kind of therapies because it's so important. And, and again, it's, it's, it's highly consistent with those risk-reducing, harm-reduction kinds of strategies. Um, what's it look like? You know, it, it's structured. You, you build on collaboration. It's got to be specific to the person. You use your MI skills to negotiate. And then you negotiate something realistic. If you, again, we got to keep our pony out of that race. It's something that your person is willing to do. And then the final thing is that we need to follow up. That, that the next time you see the person, 
you remember and say, oh, you said you were going to go do this. How did that go? And really explore. And if they did it, then you reinforce their behavior. If they didn't, you really want to explore why not. And then, you know, and then and then persist on it. That it's, um, and maybe you might need to adapt what was going on. Maybe the person has a crummy memory, as many of our folks do, or maybe they were scared. Whatever it might be, it's important that we follow up and and lovingly kind of hold folks accountable. So that's to be. The, the conclusion of my folk, my session, um, I guess one of the things that I would say to folks, as somebody who has both worked as a practitioner, trained evidence-based practices, helped to develop a couple of them, that it's important for you all to remember that ultimately you are the vehicle of change, that these are tools that can help you do a better job, but you and the relationship that you build, that you are the, you are the agent of change. So um, with that, I'm going to pass this over to Ms. Gabriella. Um, and uh, welcome, Gabrielle, from the Director of Policy and Practice for Domestic Violence and Substance Use. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, Pat, for all the lovely introductions and for keeping us thinking and applying the information to the chat. Thank you, Lori, for anchoring us in our historical context as well as helping us to understand what evidence-based practice is and what it's not. <laughs> and then, Joe, thank you so much for your common sense and grounded approach to evidence-based practice in a real-life setting. Um, I especially enjoyed how you highlighted that while consequences can work for some individuals, um, that our population is really different in that so often by the time they get to us, they've experienced so many consequences. So I often take the perspective of if consequences were going to work, I wouldn't be meeting them, right? It would have worked before I ever got the opportunity to meet them. Thanks, everyone. Um, and I am excited to share some information here. First, I want to introduce my center, the National Center on Domestic Violence, Trauma, and Mental Health. We're a FIPSA-funded special issue resource center dedicated to addressing the intersection of domestic violence, trauma, substance use, and mental health. Um, and then, of course, here's our disclaimer. Um, and then, always with appreciation to SAMHSA and HHRN and all the folks involved in making this happen, and especially all the folks in attendance and on the ground doing this work day in, day out. Um, Y'all are my heroes. So first I want to draw the connection of how domestic violence and intimate partner violence um, are really interconnected for a lot of folks with mental health and substance use uh, related effects. So we see really high rates of depression, PTSD, suicidality, um, other manifestations of trauma, including chronic pain, substance use, and of course, lifetime trauma, including ACEs, playing a role here. We also see high rates of domestic violence and intimate partner violence among women experiencing homelessness. Um, and being clear here that domestic violence can be really any violence that's happening uh, within relationships, within a household, and that intimate partner violence doesn't necessarily just mean people who are in um, long-term monogamous relationships or have kind of legally recognized relationships, that this can be really anyone in any kind of um, intimate uh, situation with someone. And so we see that 80% of women with children experiencing homelessness have also experienced intimate partner violence, and that 57% of women experiencing homelessness report intimate partner violence as the immediate cause of their homelessness. And yet, despite the um, unfortunate reality of how pervasive this experience and this manifestation of violence is amongst the folks that we're serving, we really don't have a whole lot of research around intimate partner violence and evidence-based practice. So more research is definitely needed, um, but from the data available, some things I want to highlight are seeking safety, um, which is integrated approach for substance use conditions and trauma, um, helping women recover and beyond trauma, um, which are also integrated for trauma and substance use conditions, 
relapse prevention and relationship safety, and then the WINGS expert model, which is actually um, an evidence-based model for being able to take that screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, but um, it's with a twist. So the twist here is that what we're screening for and what we're um, helping to connect people with services around if services are needed is actually the experience of violence and it's used in behavioral health and other kinds of health care settings. Um, and then we also have a systematic review of trauma-focused interventions for domestic violence survivors and I've included the link there. So from our systematic review, we found that these five core um, pieces can really help uh, enhance the effectiveness of evidence-based practices that haven't necessarily been tested with individuals experiencing domestic violence or with a history of domestic violence. Um, so psychoeducation around the causes and consequences of intimate partner violence and their traumatic effects. We see that as being very effective just as psychoeducation around so many um, situations and experiences can help to neutralize shame and really help to add to somebody's toolbox. Um, awareness of mental health and substance use coercion and sabotaging of recovery efforts. So some of the research that we've done in conjunction with the um, National Domestic Violence Hotline has found that for those individuals who experience domestic violence and are seeking any kind of behavioral health support, that over half experience um, their intimate partner, when their intimate partner uses power and control and abuse against them, um, really interfering with their attempts to access any kind of care. Um, and that can show up as, you know, stealing their medications or um, forcing folks into withdrawal or in order to exert power and control over them, um, you know, interfering with their ability to attend an appointment. Um, so one of the first things that we really want to consider when someone's having a hard time keeping up with a scheduled appointment is, is there interference from domestic violence? It could be direct interference or it could be somebody um, is literally surviving by changing up their schedule and not necessarily being where on a, someone who is abusing them expects them to be. Um, attention to ongoing safety, um, being able to integrate some safety planning as well as connecting folks to kind of um, more specialized services for safety planning. Cognitive and emotional skill development to address trauma-related symptoms and support their, in support of their goals. And a focus on strengths, um, you know, both individual strengths as well as cultural strengths from which they can draw. And then we have a toolkit that we can offer. Um, it's free on our website. The link is there in teeny tiny writing. Um, and our toolkit focuses on increasing responsiveness to domestic violence in behavioral health and social service settings, as well as primary care settings. So I know some folks are um, tuning in from SQHCs and different kinds of integrated care settings. And um, this can be a handy dandy toolkit to help increase that responsiveness. And building safety for survivors of intimate partner violence. Um, so awareness and sensitivity to the, the dynamic of domestic violence starts with the very first contact. From the very first time that we're meeting with someone, getting a sense of if somebody else has access to their phone, if they do have a phone, you know, how they would like to be contacted. Um, when I was overseeing outpatient behavioral health, when we were getting those initial contacts and, and taking some people's information as they're um, scheduling their intake, one of the, first, one of the things we would ask is um, whether we could leave messages, whether if they needed to end the interaction that they could feel free to end it to protect their safety and reach back out to us when it was safe. When I was working in housing programs, we had a lot of folks coming into our housing programs um, attempting to flee domestic violence, both from partners as well as from roommates that were abusing them. And, um, and being able to even come up with kind of a safety word that if they said that word that we understood that they were um, currently experiencing and trying to navigate a dangerous situation and, and we'd try to, we would be very, very discreet in trying to see how we could support them through that. 
Um, of course, consent, informed consent, confidentiality, transparency, um, especially in states that have mandated reporting of domestic violence, those laws can be very, very dangerous to the well-being of survivors, and so needing to have a be aware if your state has those laws, and then being able to do any kind of mandated reporting with transparency um, and in a trauma-informed manner. One thing I want to highlight is that we often talk about, you know, what's evidence-based screening, what's evidence-based assessment. And while um, I don't want to minimize the importance of evidence-based screening and assessment, when it comes to domestic violence, I think it's really, really important that we focus on building safety and trust and not focus on attempting to collect information. If our, it can be very um, dangerous for survivors to disclose uh, information around their situation and the risks that they face. And so we really need to build that safety and that trust so that, that in, those conversations can emerge in ways that are safe. Um, rather than trying to kind of pry into information, as well as offering resources without making people disclose all kinds of um, personal information, and we can have different kinds of materials available with resources. Um, and then, of course, culturally resonant gender responsive care. So we talked about adaptation. So. Modification must be careful and well-reasoned. And we really cannot assume that an intervention will retain effectiveness um, of the original. And so in this way, evidence-based practice as a verb is very important. It's as important as evidence-based practice as a noun. Right? So evidence-based practice as a noun is talking about like you know, motivational interviewing, for example. Evidence-based practice as a verb means the ongoing evaluation and monitoring, and that is exceptionally important whether or not we are um, implementing something with a high level of fidelity or in a manner that is more adapted. So one way that we can thoughtfully, methodically adapt our interventions is by first defining what are the elements of the intervention. So how can we methodically identify and define the, um, the different elements so that we can facilitate an informed adaptation? So first, defining the core elements. The core elements are required elements that embody the theory and internal logic of the intervention and are responsible for producing the main effects. And these essentially define the intervention and must be kept intact in order to produce the desired outcomes. Um, so here I'm giving the example of housing first. And so some of the core elements, I could have several slides on this, but um, keeping it brief, just on one slide. Some of the core elements. Housing is a basic human right. The only requirement for housing is the lack of housing, right? There are no other readiness factors. And that there's a rapid housing access with a focus on housing retention, fostering a sense of home, integration in a social environment and community environment, um, really supporting self-determination, which includes harm reduction approaches, and that harm reduction sometimes um, is understood as an opposition or as a choice other than abstinence. And so I wanted to, um, as somebody who, who oversaw harm reduction housing for over a decade and then went on to build and oversee harm reduction-based outpatient uh, substance use treatment and treatment for co-occurring disorders, um, I want to really dispel that notion and, and situate abstinence as part of the array and continuum that exists within harm reduction. So even operating a harm reduction-based substance use treatment program, the vast majority of folks chose abstinence as their ultimate goal in our services. What made it harm reduction was that it was the person choosing their goal and it was at their pace and we were there to support any positive change and that services were available to them based on need and not based on notions of compliance. Um, so just that was a quick aside. So harm reduction approaches and then individualized person-driven services that promote recovery as the person defines it. 
So some core elements, then we move into defining the key characteristics. These are the important pieces of the intervention, but not necessarily essential. Um, so these are maybe recommended activities and delivery methods, but could be reasonably modified to fit the practice context as well as the needs of people being served. Now here I'll say that reasonable people can disagree on what may fall under a core element versus a key characteristic. And so this is the importance of really coming together um, and discussing this as a team, as a program, um, throughout kind of leadership, as well as on the ground, as well as looking at what kind of, um, you know, what kind of fidelity tools are available, what kind of uh, publications and research evidence are available that can help inform really pulling apart the core elements from the key characteristics. So some key characteristics from Housing First, um, and of course, Reasonable people can disagree, so folks may look at this slide and go, hey, that's not, that's a core element. Um, and I will say, yes and. <laughs> so a team approach to support services, a multidisciplinary team that has the ability to directly provide nursing and behavioral health services, housing that's integrated into the community or what sometimes we call scattered site. Uh, the availability of representative payship services, some may say, um, you know, whether representative payship services are required versus available is up for kind of debate. Uh, low participant to staff ratio, weekly face-to-face -face meetings with staff, and the separation of property and clinical staff. And then we want to define the internal logic. So the internal logic is the explanation of how all of this works together. Um, and it can be helpful to set out and do a logic model if that's kind of your, your language and your wheelhouse. Um, I'm a big fan of logic models. Other people groan when they hear about logic models. So it really depends on your style and how you want to define the internal logic. Um, but the explanation of relationships among the intervention activities, behavioral determinants, and the intended outcome. So some of the internal logic using our um, same example that housing is the foundation for health and wellness, and that people are able to make meaningful progress in their recovery and well-being when they have independent housing with appropriate person-centered support. So if you decide to adapt, first off, adaptation is the norm. Um, I saw someone in the chat box earlier say, you know, like 100% fidelity doesn't exist, right? It's true in many ways. We, um, we don't operate under the controlled environment that many times um, a lot of research is first done. Of course, there's community-based research as well, but still um, there's very highly controlled um, environments and, and, that, and a level of resources that we often don't have access to in our community-based settings. Um, and as someone also mentioned in the chat box, Many times, the folks who are serving have been historically excluded from research. And so when we are looking at the preferences and the, the realities of the folks that we serve, then we would say that we absolutely need to adapt in order to make these evidence-based practices culturally responsive and really individualized to the context and the realities at play. So, if you decide to adapt, or maybe I should say when you decide to adapt. Um, document the circumstances that led to adaptation. So we don't want to adapt in a kind of um, haphazard manner. We still want to do this in a way that's methodical. We want to document the specific adaptation, and then we want to use that evidence-based practice as a verb. We want to evaluate the results. And then, of course, comparing our outcomes to those of full fidelity. And because it can be so difficult to access any kind of um, data around the folks that we serve, we want to really share our data, at least locally, so that other people who are also um, working in similar kinds of environments with similar kinds of um, realities at play can have a sense of what we've done, what worked for us, what maybe didn't work for us. Um, and we also tend to, 
uh, collect and look at our data a little more methodically when we, when we know that we're going to be sharing it with someone else. So that's an added bonus. So um, something to note is that modification should not compete with or contradict the core elements or internal logic of the intervention. And that we can seek data that can help us identify ways in which the intervention may need to be adapted. Um, for example, you might search for characteristics of interventions for a specific cultural group or a specific setting. So um, if we are, you know, seeking to implement housing first in a kind of congregate living residential setting rather than scattered site, then look for data. Look for studies that was more that were in more project-based settings. Um, and then when little data exists around a specific experience or population or community, qualitative data, especially metasynthesis, metasyntheses that kind of um, collect and, and analyze the key themes of qualitative data can be especially helpful here. So one thing I'd love to hear from folks in the chat is what common elements do you notice in evidence-based approaches to supporting people with mental health and or substance use needs? What are some of the commonalities between the different evidence-based approaches that you you have experienced with, you've heard of today, you've used in the past? Cultural humility, absolutely. Client-driven, self-determination, strength-based, choice, non-judgmental. Supporting a client's decisions, absolutely. Patience, mm -hmm. a long-term perspective. Time and time again, um, I, I learn the lesson that as long as we can keep a person alive and connected, uh, recovery, you know, everything in nature moves towards healing. Recovery is always possible. Meeting them where they are. Yes, mutually understandable language person-centered, reflective listening, so powerful, grace and empathy, keeping that door open, advocacy, yeah, understanding that there may be learning disabilities at play and we need to really emphasize what accessibility needs. Thanks, consistency, absolutely. Thanks, everyone. So many evidence-supported approaches share common elements. And so here I've just noted some of those that um, I think are especially useful for, me, for really supporting folks who experience different kinds of mental health, substance use, and housing instability concerns. And so something that I want to highlight here is the importance of the parallel process, the importance of building on existing strengths of your team, of your program? What elements are you and your team already practicing? What are you especially proficient within? And how can your strengths be leveraged for growth? So many of these common elements overlap as well as really hinge upon each other. So for example, it's hard to have like trustworthy um, services without having transparency. It's hard to have self-determination, support self-determination, without also having individualized approaches. And that all of this must ultimately be nestled with an accessible, culturally responsive, and trauma-informed approaches. And something I'll add is really what I've found time and time again is approaching situations with creativity, helping to craft and define different plans and solutions if what we're doing doesn't seem to be working in the way of the person and we would also hope for them as they define their own goals. So, you know, in this work, we never see the person as not working. We see the service as not working. And what, when we look at what do we need to do differently in order to, um, in order to have a greater chance of success while really supporting any positive change as the person defines it. And then I really want to echo what Joe mentioned um, towards the end of his segment, is that at the end of the day, 
the manual is not a substitute. Um, that some of us love manuals, some of us hate manuals. Um, at the end of the day, manuals only work when they're combined with our skills, our engagement skills, our relational skills, our cultural humility, and so much more. All right, and I'll hand it back to you, Pat. Thanks so much, everyone. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, wow. That was a ton of information and three great presentations. Thank you all. Uh, we do have lots of questions, but I thought maybe if everybody gives me a little leeway, I wanted to do the chat a little bit differently. So I, I would like the whole, all three presenters uh, to speak to this. Uh, in the chat box, there was a discussion. Somebody wrote in about having working with or trying to work with a guy who's eating out of a dumpster, hasn't been two months, and knows beyond a reasonable doubt that he's Jesus and can save you. He's not dangerous. A case could be made for grave disability, but the hospitals won't hold him for more than two hours. His delusion is caused by a serious mental illness that is out of his control and, didn't, and he did not choose it. He won't seek help or show up for an appointment because he's Jesus and not sick. How do, how do we apply our evidence-based practices and, and work with a person? Because I think a lot of the uh, participants are working with people at this level and how do we how do we make how do we use our evidence based practices? Anybody want to pop jump us off? Yeah, let me jump in. Uh, this is Lori. I, I think that a lot of the evidence based practices that we presented here are programs. You know they're structured and formal services. This is a guy who's not going there. Um, I think where the, the other part of the message that I think especially Joe and Gabriella want people to hear is that this is about adapting and using and, and drawing from the best of all of these practices. And I think one of the things here is, is how is that relationship. I think those common elements that both Joe and Gabriella talked about is, is a huge part of the focus. And what does he want? I mean, who is this guy? Where did he come from? What's he see himself going? What does he see himself doing? If he's Jesus, how does that manifest itself in his life? There might be some clues in there that, that can be used to, to engage him in a different way. And I know when I was trained as a clinician, we were always taught to, taught to um, uh, sidestep delusions, never enter the delusion essentially was the language that I was taught. And yet, I think in this situation, that's the clues in a lot of ways for where some of the next steps might be. So I think drawing from the commonalities and integrating those into common practice or into practical practice. Okay. Hi, Bob. I'm not sure if I'm on, but this is Joe. I would agree with that, and I think that you are right that, you, you know, and with somebody like him, it might take a while yeah. to really build some sense of engagement, collaboration, and trust there. Um, and that, um, that I, I, mean, I know that we have these goals about getting somebody into treatment and getting somebody onto antipsychotics and seeing a doctor for a physical and all that stuff, which is absolutely right, uh, but they're not, that person's not ready to go there yet. It may not be for a long time. It may not be ever. Um, and that uh, the system is saying, you know, that he, he doesn't meet criteria for, you know, involuntary hospitalization. So I think it is really around building that relationship and doing small incremental changes that would sort of fit within what he's ready and willing to do. Thank you. Yeah, Gabriella, just... did you want to add anything? Yeah, the only thing I would add is, you know, I just, I'm really curious about what's a good day for him. Is it a good day when it doesn't rain because, you know, the, the food doesn't get as soggy in the dumpster? Is it a good day when he finds an especially awesome treat when he's, um, you know, seeking out his food? Um, you know, would he, you know, I can remember doing homeless outreach and just, 
um, so one thing that comes to mind to me, of course, is homeless outreach. <laughs> um, but just, you know, socks. Socks are gold, right? Being able to have clean, dry socks. Um, so what can we do to um, figure out what's a, what's a little bit of a better day for him? And how can we help him have more good days? Um, and how can we really build that relationship? Um, working with folks that the mistrust was really righteous mistrust and so, so deep that it was about, you know, can I leave a package of socks on the bench for you that you can come and grab or not grab after I leave, right? And just that long-term perspective of it's going to take time and a whole lot of mini interventions that are really focused on whatever may be desirable for him before we can ever really get to some of those other pieces. I think the thumb here is meeting him where he's at. I noticed in the example, it's like he doesn't come in for appointments. This is a guy who's not going to come in. You've got to go to him repeatedly. Lots of high-frequency, short-duration contact, um, and just start building from there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to throw in one more question because it's come up in the chat box and somebody wrote it as a question. Can you speak to the tension between readiness and self-determination? There's a lot of disagreement and maybe just an issue of nomenclature differences. So we, that word readiness has been thrown around in the chat box quite a bit. And then you have self-determination. How do you... What's the, there's some tension there. People think you have to be ready for stuff. Well, well so I'd I love to go ahead. Right. <laughs> sure, thanks. Um, so thinking about that, um, yeah, when we try to, we need to meet people where they are because when we're uh, more ready than they are, then we tend to just like push them and entrench them more into staying where they are, right? Nobody likes to kind of be pushed. At the same time, understanding that readiness um, is a dynamic and that through motivational interviewing-based engagement strategies that we can have an impact on helping people become more ready, but it's never through trying to overpower or kind of drag someone to where we want them to be. Yeah. So? Look, I, would, I would add just one thing. I think you're absolutely right in terms of the EMI perspective and the internal motivation and internal readiness. The other thing that I think we sometimes need to, you know, stay mindful of is that there's there's a sort of a, a kind of an environmental readiness as well. Like, does the person have the, the skill and knowledge to actually do what we're wanting them to do so that there is that? And then the other part of it is, you know, um, does the person have, like, you know, reasonable access to whatever it is we're wanting to have them do? So that, you know, we, say, we really want you to go see a primary care doc, but you have no formal health insurance, and so nobody will see you, or there's no primary care doc, there's no health insurance. Yes, so there's, there's exactly. exactly. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off because we're going to be ending in two seconds. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.